All right. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Min hamazahi wa nafakhi wa nafasahi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, these are the two very brief uh, talks. And just to read the titles, one, an illustration of how a specific translation of an ayat is logically the more relevant and appropriate than some other translations. And another one is a brief illustration of how a specific translation of an ayat brings out some inner beauty and wisdom that I believe other translations quite likely fail to do so. Now, on the face of it, these are a very small minutiae of topics, and they are. But one of the reasons uh, I started this illustrations last, uh, last time I did the presentation, specifically last time one of the presentation was illustration of how uh, and uh, and I, a, a surah or an ayat is uh, oh, no rather how a selected ayat can be seen as absolutely self-explanatory. In other words, you do not need any external assistance to be able to see its wisdom and appreciate its wisdom and gain from it. So, in a similar vein, as I had mentioned last time that I'm going to give some additional illustrations about the Quran's elements uh, in order for us to appreciate uh, what this book is about in small, small ways. So now, for example, here it's just with respect to two translations of the ayah. So going back to where I have been, uh, again, at the cost of repetition, uh, I've prepared a table of contents, which I'll continue to update uh, of my power presentations to this particular audience. And just to recap, the first two were with reference to Allah, Allah's uniqueness, and then is a small husna, specific reference to three of them. The third and fourth were on the Quran, and the the, the first on the Quran was on the issue of the Quran being revealed in Arabic, and it is very, very significant for those who are non-Arabic speaking individuals, because for them, the issue multiplies several fold. And the second one on the Quran went a little bit further about the concept of the our prophet, peace be upon him, as prophet for all mankind and last of all prophets, and the Quran being a universal message and final stage of all revelations. And then I pointed out to additional item with reference to Quran that matters left unstated in the Quran should be left so. Uh, matters left unspoken by the Prophet should be left so. And finally, because there are quite a few stories in the Quran, uh, I, uh, well, I did that later, but controversy regards abrogation of Quranic ayat which keeps on coming back again and again. And in fairly simple terms, I had debunked that idea about the abrogation of any of the Quranic ayat. And then the fifth and sixth uh, topics were with reference to men. As I said, it's a troika, Allah, Quran, and men. So the first uh, was on his creation, man's creation, and more. And that more we had recreation, death, uh, resurrection after birth, so on and so forth. And then the second talk was with reference to some of the characteristics of man as we see through the Quran, for example, his burden, his struggle through his life, an in innate intuitive restlessness uh, in him and uh, resolve whether he exercises this resolve or not to change his own condition. Uh, then I start, went back to the Quran, uh, and, and, and in that, I had picked up four very minor subjects, but important subjects, and that was Allah's command to recite the Quran, and then we, and we dealt into that quite a bit, his forbiddance of haste in recitation and reflection of the Quran, and to seek protection whenever we recite the Quran, and finally, the aim of the Quranic narratives, the stories, you know, and, and I emphasize that these are not mere stories, they are stories with a certain purpose. And that is the key aspect, key takeaway for us should be with all those stories, 
to take away the message that it's meant to be. And not all stories have been told fully. They are told in segment as and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels it's necessary. And then, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, by way of a second brief talk, I just alluded to an illustration of a self-explanatory Quranic ayat saying that indeed there are quite a few of these ayat in the Quran that are self-explanatory. One needs to only dwell upon it, reflect upon it on one's own, and you can get the wisdom out of it as it appears. So, uh, so today, in the same vein, I'm uh, continue on the Quranic ones. And here, as I mentioned in the first title, uh, two ayats taken, one to show that logically to me, it seems the more relevant and appropriate than other translations. And the second one to show that a specific translation brings out what I believe is wisdom that other translations that fail to do so. Now, uh, a moment of pause here with respect to why am I talking about translations? This is very, very significant for most of the Muslims because they do not speak Arabic and many or most of them do not understand Arabic. And yet this is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they cherish. And the only way we are able to then, I'm putting myself in that, we are putting ourselves in proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through the translation. Now, there are hundreds of languages in, 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 in the world and I'm sure hundreds of translations abound. We have taken as a base here an English translation, English translation because this is a nation that speaks English. And most of us are quite conversant with English. Now, the issue as I even alluded to when I introduced the subject of Quran in Arabic, is that at the end of the day, really, if you come right down to it, other than let's say somebody just like myself, I read first thing after I get up and, and I've finished everything after namaz. I'll read some Quran, I'll recite some Quran, you know, a quarter of a Jews or whatever. That is in Arabic. Some I understand, other I don't understand. And I certainly am not able to fully capture the wisdom in it or the beauty in it. And so, by default, I fall back to an English translation. So, whether you want to like it or not, your default Quran reading becomes your translation. And so, it becomes very important which translation have we selected. Because all your influencing of your mind is going to come about through that translation not through the Quran in Arabic, because that is the reality. And I'm talking about reality as such. So now it becomes very important that that translation strives to provide you to the extent possible, both the wisdom and the shan of the Quran. In other words, the beauty of the Quran, which is not a big challenge. It's well nigh impossible, but it is there. This is the reality. And so we have to take the Quran translation and be able to see, appreciate, so that the word wow or I'm amazed or you choke comes through at least every once in a while. And, and, and I'm sure all these people who have translated have translated with sincere purpose but there are translations and there are translations. And then as time goes on, the translations ought to change or ought to affect you differently because what was written 200 years ago or 300 years ago by a translation today may not do the thing that it did for people at that time. So this is why I believe the translations should be looked at not as a surrogate for the Quran because there is no surrogate for the Quran other than the Arabic Quran but as close as you possibly can get to the spirit of the Quran as is. Now, of course, as I had again mentioned in that particular uh, uh, talk on Quran in Arabic, uh, the, the ideal thing to do is to become an expert in the Quranic Arabic or to strive to incrementally understand more and more of the Quranic Arabic in that language. 
But if that doesn't happen, or even if it is happening, you're still depending primarily on the translation. So you have to say, does this translation appeal? Does it do anything to my heart? Does it anything do anything to my mind? Does it do anything to both my mind and my heart? So I cannot underplay the significance for a non-Arabic Muslim to try to find a translation that appeals to him or her, both in his or her intellect and in his or her appreciation of the Quran as his or her heart speaks. So it is in that vein that I'm just doing these very minuscule things. And uh, while I do these kinds of things, sometimes I say to myself, why am I looking at this one eye, you know, and in English for that matter. And, and it becomes a very minuscule, minutiae kind of a thing. So I have I'm trying to remind myself every single day, and this is a little bit of diversion here, but pardon me for that, is I say, where is my overall macro takeaway? And it can be different for all of us. But in, for me, my macro, as far as my Islam is concerned to me, is that one, I don't do any zulm and nafs. That is, I be good to myself. Number two, I don't do any zulm on others. That is, I do good unto others. Whether it is my spouse, my sibling, my family, my community, my friends, or a stranger. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly, repeatedly says that his, that is his, his people's, his slaves' rights come even before his rights as far as we are concerned. Those two things I need to say to myself, remind to myself that these are my basic premises in my daily living as a Muslim. And underlying this premise is the following. That is, I am not self-sufficient. My range of perception into as to what I can see, my range of perception into what I can intellectualize, my range of perception into how spiritually good I get is very limited. And as a result of that, I have no choice but to have no ego, to have no arrogance. And as an adjunct to that, I say, the only thing, the only entity that has all the perception is one Zat. And I do not know him physically. I can never know him physically. And therefore, I have to have faith in al ghaib which this Quran starts off with. So, my acceptance of ghaib no matter how intelligent I am, no matter how wise I think I may be, no matter how spiritual and rich I may feel, my range of perception is so limited that I have no choice but to believe in al ghaib and I can see how vast universe is. I can realize how fast all, how vast all this is. That I can say there can only be one entity that can be able to do all this, and I put my faith in it, recognizing all the while that it's al -Gayb. With that as the understanding, and with the requirement for myself that I don't do any zulm on nafs and I don't do zulm on others. To my mind, everything falls in place. Then all that I do with respect to here, with, that is with respect to my religion and its practice, these all then become details. Another way of saying that is some uh, very small, I don't know whether it's a hadith or not, that I'd heard that I remind myself. Every morning I wake up and step out. That is whether I step out from my bedroom or step out my house. I take my conscience on my palm, on the palm of my hand. And in the evening, I come back and I say, did I bring it back or did I lose it? If I lose it, I need to do more work the following day. And it's so on and so forth. And a day melts into a week, a month, and a year. And this is all I can but do. And this is all I strive to do. So all this, you may say, what is this one? Why are you talking about it? Well, to my mind, this is an increment that adds to all that, that then leads me to say, yes, I'm doing good to myself and I'm going, doing good to others. 
So I apologize for this diversion, but I just wanted to bring in the the, the big picture into the small picture. And, and, and if I got a little bit personal, pardon me. So anyway, coming back to these, uh, we start off as always, you know, there is no understanding without any reflection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rhetorically tells us in the Quran, will they not then try to understand that is truly reflect upon this Quran? And, and everything follows from that. Uh, and the translations follow from that. That is, now you have to work on the translation because this Quran, how are you going to understand it? So the first ayat, uh, this is the illustration of how a specific translation, and here it is Muhammad Asad's, that is different from translations done by most others, but is logically the more relevant and more appropriate. Very simple. This first ayat, a lot has been said about it. A lot has been said about it uh, where, by our brother Shahzado also, who has taken an entirely different aspect to it and brought on it for us to understand from his one unique perspective. But I bring it here in a more, uh, I say, less exotic, more uh, traditional, more conventional, but still away from what we normally see. So, Al Najm, Surah 53, Ayat 1, Wa Najmu Iza Hawa. Very simple, very straightforward on the face of it. Most traditional commentators translate the above ayat as by the star when it sets. The letter wow has been translated as by, al najmu as the star, iza as when, and hawa as it sets. Actually, hawa is a verb. It sets is what it means. To be more precise in Arabic, hawa is past tense, so it is set. One more complication, when a verb is stated in Arabic, implicitly it has a pronoun attached to it. Here, the word it is attached to it. So, hawa set in past tense, the sun set. But in Arabic, intuitively, it means it set. But since it's pertaining to here, the Quranic thing, you, this past tense can also be translated as a present tense. I'm not going to go into all that, but I'm just saying Hawa is a verb and it means in Arabic it's set. And here because this star has already been introduced, so when you read Hawa or when you read in English it sets, you know that it is referring to star. But the star is as a noun does not necessarily come in sentences Arabic. Sometimes there is no noun. Sometimes there's only a verb and you understand that in the verb there is a pronoun called he or she or it and you understand that. But anyway, so Hava is at sets. Now, this literal translation has remained the preferred translation of the majority of commentators. However, one may wonder, I wonder, as to whether it accords with the context of the ayat that follow. And these are ayat 2 through 12, which it should be 12, not 13, as well as whether it appeals to my intellect, particularly in its translation as per above. So here I'm challenging myself. What does, when I read by the star and it sets, what does it do to me? I mean, does it, does it bring any, any intellectual aha? Does it do uh, bring me any spiritual thing? And I'm sorry when I read by the star when it sets, or if I ask my son to read, okay, by the star when it sets, read. And he says, yeah, I read by the star when it sets. I said, what does it do to you? Nothing, really. It just said by the star when it sets. So you take it at that level and you say, well, let, let me go further. So, let, so let's unpack this ayat further. So now, wow, or in English, by. Most of you will read and you'll see the word by. The wow here has been considered the wow of an oath taken by Allah. This we know, but in the translation, we don't know that. Okay? Conventional translations simply translate wow as by, by. 
and imply with this by that Allah is taking an oath by whatever that follows the word by. And so here the word by implies, but it is not explicitly stated, implies that Allah is swearing by the star because as you can see, the star follows. So um, the word by itself says nothing. You have to know that it's implying something. And here, as we all know, it implies that Allah is swearing. Now, that Allah deems it to be necessary to swear implies that Allah is asking man to pay close attention to what he, Allah, will be saying. However, the translated word by on its own does not draw the reader's attention to the seriousness or significance that is implied. Meanwhile, it is as if Allah is saying by this, pay attention to this now and reflect upon this now. In other words, with the letter wow here, Allah is saying, consider what I'm going to say now. To put it succinctly and authoritatively, Allah with the word wow is saying, now in English that I prefer, consider this. When you read in English, consider this with an exclamation, it throws you off. It puts you to an attention. It says, someone, in this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing my attention, asking me to leave everything and reflect on what's going to happen now. Consider this. If I say this versus bye, there's a world of difference. The translations give you by. This translation is going to give you consider, which puts you to attention, which brings the purpose Allah Ta'ala has meant to bring through the word, in this case, it's simply a letter in Arabic, wow. And we call it w in Arabic. We pronounce it w. In English, most all translations say by. And by doesn't do anything to me, I'm sorry. This then is the alternative translation proposed here for wow. The conventional translation of wow with the word by completely misses out the reflective consideration and preparedness that we need to give to what Allah has to say next. Now, second word, al-najmu, or the conventional translation, the star. However, these very common tainters Commentators through the century also admit that the noun najm, najm is a noun, the star, derived from the verb najama. It appeared. Najama means it's a verb. It appeared. It began. It ensued. It proceeded. This is the meaning, one of the meanings of the word najama, verb. And from this najama, we bring in a noun called najm. So the noun najm, besides the noun star in English, also denotes, if you will, the unfolding of something that comes or appears gradually, as if by installments. Hence, this term from the very beginning has been applied to each of the gradually received parts, nujum of the Quran, and thus to the process of Quran's gradual revelation. As such, in our alternate translation of Al-Najmu, we opt for the gradual process of Quranic revelation, or, if you will, its unfolding. So, together were Al-Najmu's alternative translation, succinctly and authoritatively states, consider the gradual process, that is, consider the unfolding of Quranic revelation. Compare this versus the conventional translation by the star. The third word is Iza, which is quite straightforward. In English, you can say Iza is for when or as. The simple preposition Iza has been aptly translated by when or as. So conventional translation of wal najmu iza is by the star when. Meanwhile, our alternative translation renders iza as as 
good enough. And so Wal Najmu Iza is now translated as consider the gradual process that is unfolding of the Quranic revelation as. Now let's go to the final word, Hawa. As I said earlier, Hawa is a verb. It's translated conventionally as set. The sun set. In Arabic, as I said, a pronoun is always implicit in the verb. And so when you trans try to translate Hawa in English, you would normally say it's set because it's a past tense. But as I mentioned, when you're reading in the Quran, Past tense can also be seen on occasion. It's, the grammar is a little bit complicated. You can consider it, you can read it also as a present tense. But anyway, the preposition it is implicit in it. So Hawa is it sets or it set. Hawa conventionally means it set, that is, and because the star has already been introduced in the conventional translation, so we all automatically understand that what it stands for. It stands for the star. And so the conventional translation of Wal Najmu Izahawa reads, as we started off with, by the star as it, the star, sets. So that's where the fourth word fits in with the conventional translation. Keeping in mind how we came up with the alternative translation interpreting the first three words, Wal Najmu Iza. This alternative translation translates Hawa as it comes down from on high rather than it sets. The conventional translation, it sets. But because the first three words have been translated in the way that we have gone through, it then takes Hawa, takes its essential essence of its meaning, and it says as it comes down from on high not as it sets it. And then what Najmu is a Hawa reads, consider the gradual process or consider the unfolding of Quranic revelation or Allah's message as it comes down from on high, as it comes down from on high. Now, so now most commentators buy the star when it sets. Muhammad Asad renders it as consider this unfolding of Allah's message as it comes down from on high. Now observe the relative impact of each of these two renderings to see which more aptly conveys the authoritative consideration that Allah conveys of the significant message that he introduces. The message being that of the gradual process of unfolding from on high of his revelation for man. When one next reflects upon the subsequent ayat, ayat 2 through 12, this alternative translation of ayat 1 looks much more logical and contextually more appropriate with the discourse embedded in ayat 2 through 12. So for instance, let's take just 1 through 4 and read it with this alternative translation of Ayat 1. So here it goes. Consider this unfolding of Allah's message as it comes down from on high. This fellow man, prophet of yours, has not gone astray, nor is he deluded. And neither does he speak out of his own desire. That which he conveys to you, coming down from a high, is but divine inspiration with which he's being inspired. I personally think this flow, this introduction, consider this unfolding of Allah's message as it comes down from a high, gives appropriate introduction to this following 11 ayat in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells people that he is simply coming up with inspiration with which he's being inspired, he is not speaking out of his own desire. He is not mad. He is not deluded. He conveys to you that inspiration which is coming to him and which is in which he's being inspired. 
if I say by the star when it stars, this when it sets, this fellow man of yours has not gone astray. Personally, it didn't do anything to me, that first ayah. Okay. <clears throat> now, this was in fact also the interpretation of this one ayat one by Abdullah ibn Abbas as quoted by Tabari. And in view of the immediately subsequent ayat's text, i.e. ayat 2 through 12, this interpretation has been regarded as fully justified by Raghib, Zamakhshari, Razi, Baidavi, Ibn Kathir and other authorities. Raghib and Ibn Kathir in particular point also to the phrase Mawaqil Najum, which appears in Surah Waqiyah, uh, Ayat 75, Fala Uqsima Bi Mawaqi Ad Najum, as referring as step by step revelation of the Quran, not the breaking of the stars, not the coming down of the stars, but step by step revelation of the Quran rather than setting of the stars as conventional translations do. So at the cost of going a little bit detail into it, I would just like to one bring out one exhibit that takes that particular ayat where again Al-Nujum appears and uh, somewhat elaborate on this. So that particular portion, that particular ayat as a matter of fact, Fala uqsamu bi mawaqi al-Nujum. Most commentators, for example, Sahih International, will say, then I swear by the setting of the stars. In the same vein that was done in Al-Najm. Al Meanwhile, the term Mawqi, of which Mawaki is the plural, denotes the time or place or manner at which something comes down. In Urdu, we say Mawqa, you know, the time has come or the, the, the place has come or the manner has come, you know, condition it has come. So mawaki is the plural of mawki, which denotes the time or place or manner at which something comes down. Now, although many of the commentators think that the phrase mawaki al-Nujum relates to the breakup of the stars at the last hour, Ibn Abbas, Ikrima, and As-Sudi, these are all giants of commentators of centuries gone by, they were definitely of the opinion strongly supported by the subsequent verses 76 through 80 of Surah Waqiyah that al Mawaqi al Najum here refers to the step by step revelation or coming down in parts, Najum of the Quran, not a breaking up or setting of the stars. So, international. Then I swear by the setting of the star. And so in view of the references of these previous scholars, Muhammad Asad rendered Fala Nujum as Nay, I call to witness the coming down in parts of this Quran. By calling to witness Fala Uksimu. The gradual manner of its revelation that is coming down in parts of the Quran points implicitly to the astounding fact that this Quran has remained free of all inconsistencies and inner contradictions despite all the dramatic changes that happen in the Prophet's life during the 23 years of the unfolding of the divine writ the coming down in parts of this Quran, Mawaqil Nujum. And this translation, if you go through 76 and 8 through 85 ayat, the first ayat immediately after, nay, I call to witness the coming down in parts of this Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and behold, this is indeed a most solemn affirmation of ours, if you only knew it. So, to summarize on this, a translator's master, mastery over the languages, in this instance Arabic and English, his perseverance to seek out what he considers the essence that is embedded in the words and phrases of the Quran, his messages, and his selfless sincerity, above all his selfless sincerity, in his endeavor come together to bring out the inner beauty and wisdom of divine Qurans 
ayat messages, but only Allah knows best. So, because it's a short talk, so I'll move on to the second illustration, if you don't mind. And this one, again, is one ayat. <clears throat> again, how a specific translation brings out the wisdom of an ayat versus other translation. Here it's Surah al Rad, ayat 13, partly ayat 13. Bahum yuja de luna feel lahi, wahua shadidul mihal. So it is only a part of an ayat. And I'm going through about a dozen translations very quickly. And I'd like you to focus on two parts of each of these translations that are in uh, bold. So here you see the translator is Sahih International. They dispute is in bold and he is severe in assault is in bold. Okay. So Sahih International, as I pointed out here, while they dispute about Allah and he is severe in assault. Number two, picked off. While they dispute in doubt concerning Allah and he is mighty in wrath. Yusuf Ali, yet these are the men who dispute about Allah with the strength of his power supreme. Shakir, yet the dispute concerning Allah and his mighty in prowess. Mohsin Khan, yet the dispute about Allah and his mighty in strength and severe in punishment. Muhammad Sarwar, while they are busy arguing about the existence of Allah, his punishment is stern. Arbery, yet the dispute about Allah who is mighty in power. Dawood, yet the believers wrangle about Allah, stern is his might. Irving, yet they argue about Allah while he is stern in strategy. Ahmed Ali, even then it is Allah they contend about but mighty is he in his power. Muhammad uh, M.A.S. Abdul Halim. Yet they dispute about Allah. He has mighty plans. And finally, they study Quran. Yet they dispute concerning Allah. He is severe in wrath. Okay, so there are these 12 translations that I go through, I went through. And what I see here is the following. Wahua shadidul mihal, we read on the right side, he is severe in assault, he is mighty in his wrath, he is the strength of his power supreme, mighty in prowess, mighty in strength, but severe in punishment. Punishment is stern, mighty in power, stern is his might, he is stern in st strategy, mighty is in his power. His mighty plan, he's severe in wrath. These translation, my takeaways, he punishes, he's stern, he has wrath, his power is very mighty, uh, stern is his might, stern, his strategy is stern, and so on and so forth. And I'll talk about that. And on the left side, the translation they dispute is about yuja de luna. And you will notice they dispute, they dispute, they dare to dispute, they dispute. Most of it is the one word dispute. So those are the two I'm going to focus on. Now, the term shahidul mihal, wahua shahidul mihal. This occurs in the Quran only once here in ayat 13 of Surah 13. Now, mihal is derived from hila, meaning a plot. Shadid, in most of these translations, is rendered severe. And so, the phrase shadidul mihal then gets rendered in these 12 translations as intense in plotting, severe in wrath, severe in assault, stern in his punishment. Meanwhile, as shown, so in, as shown on the previous exhibits, 
Translation of these phrase, severe in assault, severe, mighty in wrath, severe in punishment, stern in punishment, stern is his might, portray Allah as a stern being bent on punishment. They thereby, these translations, render the comprehensiveness and expansiveness of this phrase, which appears only once in the Quran, much too narrow when it pertains to Allah's zat. When they render Shadidul Mihal as intense and severe plotting on the part of Allah, these translators entirely forego the notion of Allah's, Allah's wisdom in all that he does. Now, Raghib is an 11th century Quranic scholar, comments on the phrase Huwa Shadidul Mihal in the following way. So, parenthetically, he starts by in a med manner hidden from man, he, that is Allah, is powerful in ingeniously planning that in which wisdom lies. Shadidul Mihal, as it refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's zat, which appears only once, which those 12 translations translated the way as I went through, this scholar who a thousand years later people refer to his work, he says, he, Allah, is powerful, Shadidul Mihal is powerful in ingeniously planning that in which wisdom lies. Now look at this translation. There is a genius aspect to it. There is planning, but it's not conniving type of planning. It's ingenious planning. It's a plan of a genius. And not only it is a genius plan, plan of a genius, but it is a plan in which wisdom lies. There is wisdom in it. All of that is lost in that translation. And we went through a dozen translations. So now, taking cue from al Rabi's Raghib's comment on who are Shadidul Mihad, what Muhammad Asad does is he interprets this phrase with a view to bring in the notion of Allah's wisdom. And so his rendering of the phrase brings out the nuance and the shades of Allah's positive attribute. This way, Wahua Shadidul Mihad. For he alone has the power to ingeniously plan whatever his unfathomable wisdom wills. Thus, Asad renders this Wahum yujadiluna fi lahi wahua shadidul mihal as, and yet they stubbornly argue about Allah, notwithstanding all evidence that He alone has the power to ingeniously plan whatever His unfathomable wisdom wills. Compare this now with one of the other 12 translations that was shown before. While they dispute about Allah and he is severe in assault. I mean, it, is, it takes out all the spiritual awe, all the intellectual impression that I get from the one versus the other. And it's in the translation. And I have to depend on the translation because I do not know the Quranic Arabic the way I should. And we Muslims in this language have not come up with a bold tashri of this Quran in the last 40 years. 1.25 billion people have not done that. We have not come up with translations that read to our heart. And with this limitation, I'm supposed to understand this Quran's message in its intellect and in its spiritual enrichment. I am at a loss. I'm trying to fumble here, trying to find out translations that will move me. So this is another example to you of how a translation can, if you strive for it, make a difference for you. It makes a difference for me. It may mean nothing and most likely means nothing to 99.9% .9 of the people, but it means something to me. Okay. So, 
Asad renders, as I mentioned, and yet they stubbornly argue about Allah, notwithstanding all evidence that he alone has the power to ingeniously plan whatever his unfathomable wisdom wills. Now, Sahih International, in, as I said, you know, look at these translations. For Yuja de Luna, Sahih uh, Sahi International, they say they dispute and all the others say pretty much they dispute. Muhammad Asad says they stubbornly argue. Stubbornly argue. Most translations render Yuja de Luna as they dispute ignoring thereby the wrangling aspect of disputing. It's not just dispute, they'll just wrangle about it on and on and on. Disputing that is embedded in the verb yuja de luna. In rendering it as they stubbornly argue, Muhammad Asad's rendition is the only one that draws that wrangling aspect of dispute in translation. All other translation, by the way, literally translate, literally translate Wahua as and he. Wahua, Shadidul Mihal, and he, that is Allah, is. Asad's rendition is the sole translation that recognizes Allah's plan's uniqueness here and adds the word alone when translating Wahua. So he doesn't say and he. He says, and that he alone, and that he alone, Shadidul Mihad, and that he alone has the power to ingeniously plan whatever his unfathomable wisdom wills. So again, I repeat what I said for the prior ayat. It pretty much applies to this also. A translator's mastery over the languages, his perseverance to seek out what he considers the essence embedded in the words and phrases of the message and his selfless sincerity in his endeavor come together to bring out the inner beauty and wisdom of the divine ayat messages which we hopefully could and should aspire to but then only Allah knows best I'm done with the dua please Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi Allahumma hidina fi man hadaytu wa atina fi man atayitu وتولنا في من توليت وبارك اللهم لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا وصف عنا شر ما قضيت فإنك يا ربنا تقبل الحق ولا يؤذ عليك اللهم ادخلنا برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين اللهم اخرجنا من ظلمات الجهل والوهم إلى نور العلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم اجعلنا ممن يستمعون القبل فيتبعون أحسنا اللهم اكفنا بحلالك عن حرامك وبطاعتك عن معصيتك وفضلك عن من سواك اللهم بفضلك ورحمتك على كلمة الحق والدين اللهم منصر الإسلام وعز المسلمين يا أكرم وأكرمين <coughs> Oh Allah, spread your mercy upon us Shower us with your blessings Increase our knowledge Grant us forgiveness And reward us with the company of the prophets in the Firdaus al-A'la Oh Allah, forgive our parents and all our friends and relatives who have passed away Oh Allah, make their graves guarded from heaven And grant them the Firdaus al-A'la Oh Allah, we have many of our friends and relatives who are sick O oh Allah, grant all of them full and speed recovery. O oh Allah, guide our children, protect them, and make them righteous. O oh Allah, we ask you every name you have elected for yourself, that none of us leave this gathering, but his pains have been relieved, his worries have been removed, his debts have been paid, his weaknesses have been concealed, his sins have been forgiven, Amen. and his needs have been fulfilled. Amen. Subhanallah wa bihamdih, adad khalqih wa rida nafsih wa zinat arshih wa midada kalimatih. سبحان الله وبحمده عدد خلقه ورضا نفسه وزنة عرشه ومداد كلماته سبحان الله وبحمده عدد خلقه ورضا نفسه وزنة عرشه ومداد كلماته والعصر إن الإنسان لفي فص إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحة وتواصل بالحق وتواصل بالصبر وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة